It's such an anointed song. I'm blessed by that. I probably don't need this yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, welcome to Grace and Truth. I'm so excited that you're here today. I know that God has something special for you. And I know that he didn't want this messy preached because he has tacked me and my sinuses. So, hallelujah, I don't care. This message needs to be preached. This is a message for you today. And hallelujah. We're going to begin this morning um, by receiving communion. So, we'll bring up the elements. Jesus is alive. Just like that song said, the weight of the curse of the law was on him as he went to the cross. But hallelujah, he had the victory. Because he had the victory, we have the victory. It was by his body broken for us that our healing was provided. And it was by his blood that the grace of God, the spirit of God is poured out on his children. And so we take communion, we receive it to remember what he has done and to glorify in his victory over sin and death because his victory is our victory. So come forward and we'll receive corporately. Oh, there is no sin so great that it hasn't been washed away by the blood of Jesus. There is I like what Corey Ten Boom said, there is no pit so deep, but Jesus is deeper still. <sighs> Hallelujah. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. And in like manner, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant, the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the remission of sins. Drink ye all of it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your sacrifice, your great love for us that you came on this rescue mission to redeem your children, to save us from death, to bring us into life and life eternal. We thank you, Father, for your healing that you bought with your body when you took the curse of the law into your flesh and condemned it in death. We thank you that you rose again, and with you we rose too into newness of life, everlasting glory with you, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that you extended grace and mercy forever towards us. And we will ever declare that you are worthy, and because you are worthy and we are in you, that we are worthy to be called the children of God. We give you praise and glory, and for that all, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, <clears throat> take a few moments to greet one another, and uh, hello, hello. All right, good morning. Um, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son Jesus and all that he's done for us. And we are so privileged to come together to learn about you and to study your word. And Father, you tell us in your word that we are to hold fast to the profession of our faith. Today, Lord, I want you to open our eyes so that we can see and our ears so that we can hear and the eyes of our understanding so that we can truly believe what you have said and truly understand just what this faith is. We give you prayers and glory that you are here. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. And I thank you, Father, that the word that is spoken today is anointed. And help me, Father, to make it clear. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we spoke about hope, and we based that, we started with um, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And so today I wanted to take a look at faith. Just a little review. We talked about hope. We said that hope must be based in truth. And hope is a rope that connects us to the truth that we haven't experienced yet. So today we're going to move on to faith. Because faith is just a bit more. It's a degree beyond hope. And we need, to, we need faith. We have need of faith. Because faith, tied with grace, is the means of our very salvation. It's by grace, through faith, you are saved. And so the enemy, knowing this, um, needs to discredit either grace, which he does by, you know, by saying that it's not enough, you know, that it's too simple, it's too easy. Or he comes against faith. And how does he come against faith? Quite often he comes against faith by making faith a work. And I come out of the Word of Faith movement. Um, and in the Word of Faith movement, it was a work. And I learned how to work that puppy. But the problem with working faith is it doesn't work. It didn't work. You know, we were taught you, that confessing it, you confess it and you confess it and confess it, and you can bring it to pass through your confession. Well, there's value in confessing things, but it's the confession that you believe that has value. And it's confessing what the Word says and believing what the Word says that has value. If you're confessing, you can confess all day and all night, and if you're not really putting faith in it, that confession's not going to come to pass. And God woke me up the other morning, and he said, Elaine, confession is not like shoots and ladders, you know, Faith is not like shoots and ladders. I used to have this idea that, and we were taught that where our confession had to be right. It had to be, per, you know, you had to keep your confession true. And if it was somehow, if you confessed enough times, it was like your faith meter would get higher and higher, and then you'd blow it and then go back to start. It's like shoots and ladders. You know that game the kids play? You get so far and then you have to go back to start. God said, I'm not like that. There is no faith meter. You know, there's no tipping point for faith. Yeah. It's, it's a matter of you either have faith or you have unbelief. And unbelief will counter faith. And if you have unbelief, well, that's not faith. But we'll get into that. So, what is faith? What is, well, first of all, what faith is not. What faith does not do. All right. Faith does not move God. That's a surprise, because I was taught that faith moved God. But faith does not move God. How can I say that? Here's the deal. What does faith do? Faith appropriates what God has already done. The moving has already been done. Faith does not make God forgive you. God already forgave you. God forgave sin 2,000 years at the cross. Faith appropriates what God has already done. Faith does not make God heal you. Faith appropriates the healing that Jesus already provided at the cross. All faith does is it assures you that the promise that God has already provided is yours. That's what faith does. So faith is not moving God. God is not moving. Jesus Christ sat down at the right hand of God the Father, and Jesus Christ at the cross said, It is 
finished. God does not have to move. God's work is finished. That's why Jesus sat down. And so now God, our glorious God, has provided us with gifts. He has given us his grace and he has given us his faith so that we can appropriate the gifts he has given us. The faith you have didn't come from you. See, I used to think that faith was something I had to work up, you know, because they said faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and that is a Bible verse. But when you read that chapter in context, it is talking about salvation. So faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of salvation. And I would say, because salvation comes through grace by faith, faith comes by hearing the word of grace. Faith comes by hearing the gospel, the good news that God loves you, that he died for you, that he paid the price in full and now you are alive in him. And because you are alive in him, all of the blessings of Abraham are yours. All of the blessings for the righteous man are yours. All of the blessings and none of the curses are yours because you have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. Whew. But that faith is not something you have to work up. It isn't. Well, then how do I get it? Well, first of all, faith comes as we acknowledge every good thing that is in us because of Jesus Christ. Faith comes when we begin to see who God is and what his heart is towards us. Because God has created us as creatures of persuasion. We needed to be persuaded. You know, I met Randy, but it took him a while to persuade me that he was the man of my dreams. He had to woo me a little bit. And God has made us that way. We don't just jump in. We want evidence. See, there's a fallacy out there that faith is blind. Faith is not blind. God's kind of faith is not blind. God's spirit persuades you of the truth of the matter. God's grace, that divine influence on your heart, persuades you of the truth of the promises. And once we are persuaded, then we can lose all fear. And once we lose all fear, we can walk in assurance that the promises of God are ours. So faith becomes a simple thing that rests upon that divine persuasion in our heart. And once you see Jesus and you understand God's love for you, it is, it is so easy to allow your faith to be drawn towards him and towards those promises. And then those things blossom like a flower into your life. Because it's not you doing it. It's Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, who brings these things to pass in our lives. Hallelujah. So I said, faith doesn't move God. Faith doesn't make God forgive you. <clears throat> and faith doesn't need to be great in order for it to work. You know, one day the disciples said to Jesus, um, and let's go to Luke 17, chapter 5, or no, 17, verse 5, starting in verse 5 of Luke, chapter 17. 
we'll get there yet. <clears throat> One day the disciples said unto the Lord, increase our faith. See, this is law thinking. This is old covenant thinking. That somehow um, in order to, you know, that, that, that there's little faith. And Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. We'll get into that later. And then he talked about the great faith that the centurion had. So there is little faith and there is great faith. But the disciples said, oh, Lord, increase our faith. We need more faith to believe the things you're saying. And Jesus said to them <coughs> in verse 6, the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and it should obey you. So it does not take great faith in order to have miracles happen. It doesn't take great faith in order for you to appropriate the promises of God. But it does, it just takes the little faith. And God said that he has provided each man with the measure of faith. And that word measure means the correct amount. The proper amount. God has given you the proper amount of faith that you need. For whatever you need. First of all, you have received the proper amount of faith to believe him for salvation. That's the first thing. And with that, you have received the proper amount of faith to believe for any of the promises of God. God has given that to you. It's a gift from God. In fact, faith is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Faith is a fruit of the Spirit. If we go over to Galatians 5, let's go over there. Galatians 5, 17, I think it is. Close enough, let me see. Nope, not that one. Um, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The very faith that you need to appropriate any of the promises of God has been provided to you by the Spirit of God which dwells in you. God has provided everything you need spiritually to be successful in this world and the next. God's that good. He's that good. And it's not your faith, it's his faith. Man, see, I have a hard time. <clears throat> you know, I can believe, maybe I can believe that um, Verna can pray for me. Maybe I can believe that she can pray for me and that she has faith to believe for my healing. Now me, I'm kind of doubtful on my own. See, my own faith. Now, but, and Verna, maybe I'm doubtful that she would pray for me and something would happen. But do I have the faith that if Jesus prayed for me, if Jesus prayed for me, I would be healed. See, I have the faith to believe that Jesus has faith for my healing. Well, you know what? We've been given his faith. The very faith that you have is not your own. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. We walk not just by faith in Jesus Christ, but we walk by the faith of Jesus Christ. And that's where our salvation lies. That's where our healing lies. That's where our prosperity lies. That's where our very abundant life lies in Jesus Christ. Because you are in him and in the Father. <sighs> Amazing things. These are things we need to wrap our head around so that we can walk in faith. The assurance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And that's how Hebrews 11.1 1 defines faith. It's the assurance of the things hoped for. The evidence of of the things not seen. The very fact that you have faith 
is evidence that that thing is yours. Isn't that good? That's good, Ginny. The very fact that you have faith is evidence that healing is yours. Hallelujah. So we don't walk by just blind faith. We have evidence because we believe. And it's not just mere belief. The Bible says that the demons believe and they tremble. So it's not just mere mental assent. This faith that we have is something more. It's something stronger. It's a knowing in our spirit. God wants us to know. It's not just head knowledge. There's a heart knowledge that God has placed within us that tells us this promise is true and this promise is mine. What, how come we have this placed in us, so what, what stops this heart knowledge from being manifested into our life? It's because we, rather than using faith, we put our eyes and our focus on ourselves rather than on Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the finisher of our faith. He's where it starts and he's where it finishes and we get caught up in the middle. And I speak from experience because when I was sick 10 years ago and dying, the constant drumbeat in my head was, what do I have to do to be healed? See, I had taken healing and somehow in my mind, healing had to be earned. I didn't recognize that it was a gift just like salvation was a gift. That deliverance from sickness is a gift just like salvation is a gift. As you have received Christ, so walk ye in him. How do we receive Christ? By grace, through faith. How do we walk in him? By grace, through faith. It really is that simple. The things that you have need of, receive them by grace, through faith. But see, there's still that word faith out there. And we say that word, but do we really understand what it means? And we need to understand what it means. <clears throat> Faith is being fully persuaded. Remember, you're a creature of persuasion. It's being fully persuaded. Look at Abraham. Paul says in Romans 4, Verses 20 through 22. <clears throat> we're talking, we're looking at Abraham, the father, what? The father of our faith. Abraham was a man who knew something about faith. And so we look at Abraham. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. The Abraham was fully persuaded. What was he fully persuaded with? He was fully persuaded that the God who spoke to him was fully able to do exactly what God said he would do. And you and I need that same type of understanding. We need to, that same type of persuasion within our heart. God, the creator of heaven and earth, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, is able to do everything for you that he said he would do. If God said, by my stripes you are healed. He is able to bring about that healing. If God said, and he did, I will supply all of your needs 
according to my riches in glory, then he is able to supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. And let me tell you something, God is not stressing out about your problems. He's not stressing out about your problems. He knows what you have need of. He has provided it. It's time to take it. Let's go back to um, Luke chapter 17. Because Jesus went on with that story. <clears throat> In verse 6, Jesus was talking to the apostles, or to the, to the disciples, and he said, If ye had a grain, of, if ye had faith, yeah, we said that, okay, so in verse 7, but which one of you, okay, which one of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meet? Okay, so what is Jesus saying here? He's just got done saying, you don't need great faith. Now he's still talking about faith. And he says to the disciples, if you had a servant, when he came in from the field, would you say, here, let me pull up a chair and you can sit down and I will serve you a meal. And Jesus asked the disciples then, no. And would not rather... Say unto him, make ready with wherewith I may sup and gird myself and serve me till I have eaten and drunken and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I don't think so. I trow not. So here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, you have a servant. It's called faith. Now, what good is a servant who doesn't do his work? A servant who doesn't do his work is not good, worth anything. And Jesus is saying, you have faith. If you had just a little faith, it will move the sycamore tree into the ocean. Jesus is saying, you have a servant called faith. Use it. Use it. You've been given faith. Use it. The reason we don't see faith working is because we don't use it sometimes. We just sit back and wait for faith to happen to us. It doesn't work that way. God has given us grace. He has given us faith. He has given us these tools to use. So use them. Use the tools God has given to us. Hallelujah. And as we put that faith to work, you can be assured that the Holy Spirit is going to bring things to pass. You can be assured of that because God is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, when we look at the word faith in the Bible, it is the word pistis. And I want to go back and tell you exactly what that means. Wrong. So, that word pistis means persuasion. Okay, and we've talked about that. It means moral conviction of a righteous truth, the truthfulness of God, especially reliance upon Christ for salvation. Faith means especially. Now, when that word especially shows up, it means especially. This is the most important meaning of it. Reliance upon Christ for salvation. Now we're going to start on the 23rd. That's a Wednesday night. We're going to start um, the Connie Witter tapes.
the study through Romans. And so I have creatively stolen her next point. So, because it's so good. And it's something that I want you to take to heart because this is going to change the way you look at faith. It's going to change the way you look at the Word of God. If we remember that faith means reliance upon Jesus for salvation. And when we mean salvation, salvation is deliverance from all your problems. It's deliverance from sickness. It's deliverance from death. It's deliverance from sin and all the effects of sin and even the pleasure of sin in your life. It's all of deliverance. And so when we know that, Reliance upon Jesus is what faith is. Get that into your heart. What is faith? Faith is reliance upon Jesus. And so when we look at a Bible verse that has the word faith in it, I want you to translate that in your mind to reliance on faith. So what does that look like? It's a verse like, you are saved by grace through the reliance on Jesus for your salvation. Amen. You take a verse like, the law is not reliance upon Jesus for your salvation. It changes the way we look at things. Whatsoever is not of reliance on Jesus for your salvation is sin. Wow. I want to um, pull up a few more. Because it's so good once you start doing this. It, it changes so much of what the word says. Because We've lost the full meaning of faith. We've made it into something it's not. So, um, let me see. The righteous, the just shall live by the reliance of Jesus, the reliance on Jesus for salvation. You know, when we say the just shall live by faith, well, <laughs> that doesn't have a lot of meaning. But when you say the just... The righteous man shall live by relying on Jesus for his salvation. That's powerful. I can believe that. My heart can be fully persuaded in that because that's what I'm doing every day is relying on Jesus for my salvation because I know that I have no power. I am helpless to save myself. I'm helpless to do anything without Jesus. I'm helpless in this world without him, but when I rely on him for my salvation, suddenly his grace empowers me. That divine influence on my heart enables me to walk as a king in this earth. I become fully persuaded of his goodness and his love towards me. And then sickness has to flee. It has no right over me because that is part of the curse of the law. And I have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Glory to God. I've been redeemed from those things. I've been redeemed from lack. My purse doesn't have holes that, where the coins fall out. I have what I need because I have Jesus, and I can rely on him. He is fully trustworthy. Even when I'm not, he is. Hallelujah. Even when I'm not, he is. And I no longer have to worry about how great or how small my faith is because even if it's this big, I can place it in Christ and that sycamore tree will be planted in the ocean. That mountain will be removed, not because of me, but because of what Jesus did at the cross 
for me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Grace is childlike faith. You know, of course, you guys are going to get sick about hearing about my grandbabies, but <clears throat> so I'll use that baby back there. You know what? That baby doesn't have a care in the world about where her next meal is coming from or whether she's going to have warm clothes on her feet. She doesn't have a care in the world because she has put her trust in mom. She knows mom is going to be there at her first cry. Mom is going to be there. And we are supposed to, that's what faith is. It's that childlike trust that our daddy God will be there at our first cry to comfort us, to feed us, to provide for us, to love us. Whatever we have need of, we can take our faith, our reliance upon Jesus, and we place it at his feet, and he will do exactly what he said he will do. And your heart needs to be fully persuaded of that. Your eyes needed to be focused completely on that. Our God loves us and he wants our needs met. And he has provided everything that we need for this life and for righteousness. And all we have to do is put our servant faith to work and reach out and receive what our daddy has for us. Hallelujah. That's faith. That's the faith he has given us. That's the faith we walk in. That's the faith we need. Hallelujah. I want to see if there's anything else I want to bring out. I want you to remember that one point that that we all be hearing from Connie Witter when we start that study. Anytime you see the word faith in the scripture, I want you to translate that as reliance upon Jesus Christ. It will revolutionize the way you read the word of God and it will persuade your heart. And you need that persuasion because without it, you're, not, you're going to walk by sight and not by faith. I love that. So I will walk by relying upon Jesus Christ for my salvation and not by sight. What I see, I will trust what God says. I will rely on Jesus Christ for my deliverance and not by what I see. Hallelujah. It's a good word today. Today it's a short one, people. I don't know if the meal's ready. Hallelujah. Huh? So we're going to have plenty of time for fellowship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lane. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right up. Oh, it didn't come up what I wanted. Let me go back here and fix this. Hallelujah. Uh, what? I want that scripture up. I'm going to challenge us this morning after hearing that message. This is scripture has been kind of up in front of me lately challenging me so I thought I'd share it with you guys and challenge you guys with it. Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or challenges, think of something that is almost impossible to, to believe that God could do for you. I mean, I mean, go way out there. I mean, really go way out there. And even way out there, it's not even close to the abundance of God. Because it says, Now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly all that you ask or think. And sometimes that's, we get caught up in that because we think our faith is little. We think that uh, we may not understand God the way we should. And maybe sometimes we don't. That's why we gather together and learn and grow. 
But if we'll take a message like today and say, you know what? I can trust in Jesus. I can't trust in my flesh. I may not be able to trust in this or that. But I can trust in Jesus. So if I can trust in Jesus, and Jesus is the Him in this scripture, we can start to stretch ourselves and put ourselves out there because as easy as it was, or easy as it looked for Elaine to get up here and share with us today, you can be rest assured, as she even said, the enemy does that work. He comes in and tries us, tries to get us to doubt whether what we believe is true, whether how we see God is correct, whatever the doubt is, that's his tactic is to come in and keep us from going out there. Sure. Wow, this thing is nice. I think you get a kick out of that. This is out of the Amplified Bible. And I apologize, Lane. I'm not trying to run over your... Now to him who by his, in consequence of the faction, or of the action of his power that is at work within us, is able to carry out his purpose and to do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. See, that's how we need to start seeing the sozo. That's the word that she talked about, the, the salvation, saved, healed, delivered, set free, prospered, made whole. That All that came at salvation. Amen. That was all in the package. And prospered would be one of these. But that's not just it. He wants us to challenge him. All right, Lord, I believe that you've called me to X or Y to preach, to share, to write a book, uh, to sing, to play a musical instrument, whatever it is. I've been thinking about taking up boxing, actually. And then I reminded myself I'm almost 58 years old and thought the better of it. But you know what? If I really felt that that way, I, I think I'd go for it. It sounds fun. Not the getting hit part, but hitting sounds fun. <laughs> But, but I do have a German cranium, so that being hit may actually hurt them more than me. But, but it was just something that I really want to challenge us as a church. I mean, individually we can be challenged by this, but how about as a body? How about as a body of believers? See, it's interesting because I stand up here today compared to six months ago, and it looks way different today than it did six months ago. And, but you know what? We believed God. This is His work. This isn't our work. This is His work. And we just trusted and believed, and you guys are the fruit of it. And, it, and this is just the beginning. This, this little one is just starting to walk. Amen? This place is going to take off and run real soon because we're trusting God for that. So... That's my challenge today, not only to me, but to you.